name is Stu and we just want to give a massive welcome to each and every one of you that are joining with us today. Now we believe that everybody has a next step to take in their faith no matter where you're at. So if that is something that you want to do you can do that by texting next step to 69922 or if you happen to be joining with us in person you can do that by going into the lobby and touching base with somebody at the next steps booth. If you want more information that is a great place to go so make sure you do that. We also want to say a massive thank you to each and every one of you that have been partnering with us in your generosity through Trace Church. Over the course of the last couple of months, it has been incredibly difficult for so many people and we have been able to have a massive impact in our community directly from your giving. So we want to say thanks to each and every one of you for doing that. Now, if that is something that you haven't done and you would like to do, you can do that by texting Trace COS to 77977. We always want to be growing in generosity. So so thank you again for helping us out through that. And then finally, we want to hear from you, especially if you're watching online. Although you can't be with us in person, we still want to hear from you. So we have a team right now that are engaging with everybody online. So make sure that you comment, that you like this post, that you share it so that we can get the gospel out there digitally. And now that's all that we have for this morning. We hope that each and every one of you enjoy the service. I invite you guys to stand as we worship Christ this morning. Here we go. Come on, sing salvation sounds. Here we go. Salvation sounds a new beginning. Distant hearts begin believing. Redemption's been. to that love knowing that he has a good and perfect will for our lives. Come on, I just invite you to sing, tearing through the veil of darkness. Here we go. Tearing through the veil of darkness, breaking every chain you set us free, fighting for the furthest heart you gave your life for all to see. Tearing through the veil of darkness, breaking every 
building or whether you're online with us this morning, we're so glad that you're here with us. It's so good to just be the church wherever we're at. We're going to do a song today as we, as we continue to worship called Seasons. And I think it's, it's maybe my favorite song from this past year. Maybe some of you have kind of latched onto it as well. It talks primarily about the winter seasons in our life. And it doesn't mean winter as this time when just the worst tragedies hit us. It talks about winter as the times when we just feel worthless, when we can't do the things that maybe we want to do. And I think that's what this past year has been for so many of us. I don't wanna downplay the tragedy, there has been plenty of that. But for most people, it's been a winter season just, just because of maybe a little bit of lost purpose. I think we're all feeling that. Maybe you're someone who had to quit a job to be home with your kids, to school them, and there's a little bit of lost purpose there. Maybe you're a teacher and the year's so weird, you're just like, I'm not connected with my students the way I usually am. Some lost purpose there too. Maybe you were a person of hospitality and your home's just been empty or, or you were a person of generosity and your income's down. We've all lost a little bit of just kind of who we are, I think, in this season. This song is gonna talk about trees. It's gonna use the analogy of trees a lot. And I was thinking about that, like what do trees do when they lose their purpose? When winter comes and they can't do their job, they drop their leaves, they can't filter the air anymore or, or feed wildlife or regulate humidity, all the stuff that trees do, they take all that energy that used to go into what they do and they send it down into their roots. It's just a transfer of energy where you can't see it. They're still trees. They're still capable of the things that they're capable of. They're just not in season. It's just not time to do it. If they were to become impatient, try to put leaves out in the middle of January, we all know it, a lot of them would die. And as I think about us with our winter seasons, I think our response needs to just be the same as the trees. That when these hard times come, when we can't do the things that we want to do, when we need to grieve or, or we deal with illness or our family just needs us for a time, we take that energy that used to go into what we do and we just put it down into our roots. And we say, okay, where I used to do all this stuff here, all that energy right now is gonna go into prayer. It's gonna go into my roots. I'm gonna do the unseen thing. Maybe all the energy that was over here, I'm gonna put it into my roots. I'm gonna get, just get counseling for things I haven't dealt with. Energy into the roots. So often this past year, if you drove past this church on a Sunday, we looked like a dead tree. We looked dead. There's four cars in the parking lot and somebody talking to a camera. That looks like a dead church. But we did the same thing. We just took our energy when we couldn't do what we wanted to do. We put it in our roots. We're still people of prayer. We're still people of generosity all through this season. We're still the church. It just hasn't been our season for a while. I wonder how much Jesus felt the frustration that we feel. I think sometimes when these times come, we say, you know, God, I'm, I'm a leader. Why aren't you giving me influence? I'm a... I'm a great encourager. Why don't I have close friends? Why aren't you giving me what I'm gifted for? And God says, it's just not your season yet. And I think Jesus may have felt the same way a bit, and God may have had to say the same thing to him. Jesus came into season a little bit late, it would seem. He didn't start his ministry till he was 30 years old. And so you imagine all those years beforehand where he had to watch the sick and the suffering and couldn't do anything about it yet. It wasn't his time. And I wonder if he ever prayed, God, can I just do this one thing real quick? Will you just let me, will you let me fix this person? We don't have to tell anybody. 
God said, it's not time yet. We assume from scripture that his father Joseph was dead by the time Jesus started his ministry. We don't see mention of him in scripture. So you can imagine Jesus having to sit by his earthly father as he dies. He's, he's going to save the world. He's going to raise the dead. He's going to heal the sick. And I can only imagine that he might have said, God, will you let me just heal him? I can do it. Do you know what I'm capable of? Yes, you do. And I'm sure it broke God's heart, but he said, it's not your season yet. It's just not your time. And I think if, if Jesus can accept that, we can too when we hear that in our own lives. Psalm 1 says, the person that meditates on the word of the Lord, that, that's the person that prays, the person with the energy in his roots that does the unseen things, that person is like a tree planted by a stream that bears its fruit in season. Listen to that line, it says in season. And that's the, that's the literal translation of that verse. It doesn't say you're gonna bear fruit every second of every day in your entire life at every juncture, you're gonna be completely effective and amazing. No, it says you're gonna bear fruit in season when it's time. We're all gonna bear fruit, but we have to be planted first. And so many people would tell you that they got planted in the winter seasons of their lives. So many people would look back and tell you the biggest things they ever did and the biggest components of who they are were a product of those winter seasons. I think these times are so precious to God when we are just, we keep that energy down for just a while till he tells us it's time to move. So that's what this song is about, just the God of the seasons and us as a people who wait till he tells us it's time. So let's, let's sing this together this morning. Like the first of the rose, winter comes for us so Oh, how nature appoints us with the nature of patience. Like a seed in the sky, I've been bearing to grow. see to Sequoia and I Take your time, could have saved us in a second, and instead you 
today as the God of our seasons. God, we worship you as the God of our purpose. And we give our seasons, we give our purpose to you, God. We place them in your hands and we ask, God, that you you guide our lives in such a way that we know when it's time to act, that we know when it's time to rest, that we know when it's time to pray. God, we, we place ourselves before you and just ask. We aren't, we aren't smart enough, we aren't wise enough, God to direct these things ourselves. We need you to show us our path. God, we love you, and that is the desire of our hearts today, that we follow that path. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. You can all be seated. Every one of us walked through those doors in this, this morning with a story. And regardless of how your story reads up until today, your heavenly father wants to meet you right in the middle of it. Uh, let me let me say something on, on the side really quick, a tangent. How many of you guys believe like Nikki should be up here preaching? I mean, come on, can we give her a, seriously? Like that was, that was incredible. Thank you for sharing that, Nikki. And uh, man, just incredibly grateful for this team. Uh, I do have a few announcements really quick. And then I wanna give you a heads up about our subject matter today because it is gonna be a deeper subject. But really quick, ladies, this Tuesday, we kick off our women's Bible study to get our women's ministry kicked off. Who's excited about that? If you're not, you're not very excited. Who's excited about that? Okay. Uh, if you haven't signed up for that, it's going to be every Tuesday again, starting this Tuesday. I believe it's for eight weeks, six, eight weeks, something like that. You can look. It says it on there. If you, anytime you want information about something coming up at Trace, the best place that you can go is our app. So if you haven't downloaded our app, please do that. Um, but again, ladies, this, this particular Tuesday, we kick that off 6.30 to 8.30. Childcare is available. So if you have any questions about that, you can ask us out of the Next Steps booth. But we'd love for you guys to participate in that. Also, fellas, uh, we're kicking off our men's ministry in a little bit different of a way. This coming Saturday here at Trace at 7.30, we're going to have the Conor McGregor fight. And so we're going to have a fight night. And we're just going to come and hang out. It's a great, easy invitation uh, if you just want to invite a neighbor, invite a friend that maybe has been disconnected or doesn't want anything to do with the church, this is a great way just to kind of get them introduced to who we are. If you want to do that, we'd love to uh, empower you to do that. Also, uh, guys, bring an awesome appetizer. Uh, we're just going to have some food out in the lobby. We're going to watch the fight in here. Uh, but we're looking forward to that again. This is one of those opportunities that gives you the, uh, it empowers you to have an easy invitation to invite other guys to come and be a part of that. We're also going to be casting a little bit of vision on what men's ministry is going to look like moving forward here at Trace. Also, for those of you that have been giving to the kingdom of God through Trace Church, thank you so much for your investment. We couldn't do what we do without you. And so if you've come prepared to give today, obviously you can give online, give through our app. But if you're looking for a place to give today, you can give around the room. There are buckets at the tables. Feel free to drop uh, your offering off there. If you're new here to Trace, we're incredibly grateful you're here. It's a blessing to us that you're here. And so there's no obligation, I promise you, there's no obligation to you whatsoever. We don't want anything from you. We want something for you. Now, today we're gonna be talking about the subject of suicide. And anytime we have heavier, heavier subjects here at Trace, you're gonna see a sign out in the lobby right before you come in through the doors. It says, caution, 
uh, explicit material. And so if you happen, I can't see everybody, so if you happen to have a child in here or somebody of the age range that you don't feel necessarily comfortable having them in here to be a part of that conversation, uh, then we would encourage you to take them to Trace Kids. Uh, again, that space is specifically created for them, for them to have a great time. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to tr transition and get into our time of the message. Father, thank you for this morning. Uh, God, thank you for who you are. God, thank you that as we wrestle with a very deep subject, God, we, we know that you're leaning in our direction. Father, one of my favorite proverbs is that you lean down to listen to us. You lean down to listen. And so for those in here this morning that are hurting, maybe more deeply than they've ever exposed, or maybe for people that we know that are hurting, maybe it's people watching online or listening at a later time, Father, would you remind them that you are leaning in their direction, that you're leaning down to listen to their pain. God, that you're not gonna allow anyone to walk through the pain and suffering of life alone, that you wanna walk with them, and that's both through your presence, but also through your people, through us. And so, God, we just invite you to speak this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, what is up, Trace Church? Uh, always good to be with you. First, I just want to say welcome to any of you that are joining us in person for the very first time uh, today, whether you got invited by a friend, maybe you saw our, all our new street signs. I've really enjoyed uh, getting to watch people look at the one uh, off of Woodman that says church doesn't suck. I love getting to see people kind of look at that and do, you know, one of those. And so a double take. So maybe you saw that or maybe uh, you've been watching us online for a while now, but decided to join us in person. Uh, whatever the case, we really are so honored to have you guys as guests today. And if there's anything you need, any questions that you have, feel free to ask us. Uh, we'd love to get you to connected to what God is doing uh, here at Trace. But next, I just want to say welcome to all of you that are joining us online uh, today. We know this is a difficult season, uh, and we've said this from the very beginning, and so I'll say it again, uh, that we're ready whenever you are ready, uh, that as a staff, as Aaron uh, has talked about several times before, we've taken a look at the numbers almost every single week and continuing to watch those, and we're seeing a downward trend, which is exciting for us because we are very hopeful for a day that's coming uh, where we get to be under the same roof once again, worshiping God all together. But until then, we're glad to have you with us online, glad to have you as a part of the conversation today. Uh, my name is Josiah, and I have the opportunity to be the student pastor here at Trace, and I love getting to work uh, with the students. But as a church, we've been in this series for the last couple weeks now uh, called Let's Talk. Uh, and the vision behind this is very simple, that as a church, we want to be talking about some of the things that we believe uh, the rest of the world is staying silent about. And so that first week, Dr. T, he came in, he talked to us about screens and the effects they're having on both our brains and our behaviors. And we were challenged as a church uh, to go on the screen fast for two weeks. And so hopefully you've been a part of that and involved in that. And then last week, Aaron, he came and he talked to us about salvation. And while it's a hard truth, it's no less true that salvation comes only from Jesus Christ in the name of Jesus Christ. And to some degree, that should burden us. That should burden us to get our neighbors, get our friends get our family members in a relationship with Jesus. But today I want to go a little bit different of a direction, and you saw what the topic was, uh, but today I want to talk about an epidemic that has been a part of our culture for a while now, but I think it's also been neglected both in culture and in the church, and that's this word right here of suicide, suicide. That today I want to have that discussion, but before we dive into that, I want to say a couple things very, very clearly this morning, and so hopefully you hear them. Um, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a trained psychiatrist. I'm not a licensed 
uh, counselor. Uh, very simply, I'm a pastor, and I've spent a lot of time studying this subject, both formally and informally. And if you'll allow me today, I'd love to share uh, with you a couple of the thoughts uh, that I've had. It's actually uh, been somewhat funny over the last several weeks. I'm pretty sure I got my um, assigned FBI agent uh, pretty worried about me uh, through the things I've been Googling. I had to type, uh, you know, in the search bar a couple times. I promise this is just for research uh, to make sure nothing crazy happened. And then uh, I told our staff, you know, don't go look at my search history. You guys will get worried about me for sure. Um, but I tell you all of that because I need you to know uh, I've worked really hard really hard over the last couple months uh, to prepare a message for you guys that is both convicting and compelling uh, when it comes to the topic of suicide. And really today, I just have two goals, just two goals. And they surround these two words right here of awareness and action. That as a church, I want us to come to a better awareness of the topic of suicide, both cognitively but also down here in our real lives where we walk and breathe um, and have a better awareness of that. But the second thing I want to be true of us is that everybody watching online, everybody here in this room uh, today, I want us uh, to feel more comfortable to take action, to take action against the problem of suicide. And so we're gonna start with that first word of awareness. We're gonna go ahead and dive in. And uh, so to dive in, many of you guys know this about me, but I'm a preacher's kid. Uh, not only was my dad a preacher, his dad was a preacher, and his dad was a preacher. And so I come from a long line of preachers. Uh, but not only was I birthed in the baptistry, and not only did I grow up in the church, that was like my second home, but for most of my life, I've really struggled to know which one of the women holding me as a kid was actually my mother. I feel like I was just passed around in our children's ministry so often, still struggling with that to that, this day. Um, just kidding. But I tell you that because uh, I've spent a lot of time in church. I've spent a lot of time sitting where you guys sit, I've spent a lot of time listening to someone like me uh, preach dozens, if not hundreds of sermons. And although that's true, although I've spent a lot of time in church, although I've listened to a lot of sermons, I don't think I've ever heard an entire sermon devoted to the topic of suicide. And that's not to say I've never heard suicide talked about in the church, it's just that generally when I've had these conversations, they've been behind closed doors, and soundproof to offices and hushed tones to make sure nobody overhears. And, and I say all of that uh, because, you know, over the last several weeks, I've started to ask myself that question of why is that? Why don't we talk about suicide more in church? And my first thought was, well, maybe it just doesn't show up in Scripture enough. Maybe it's just uh, not there as often as I thought it was. But as I've studied this, that just simply isn't true. Because if you look throughout scripture, people are always surprised to hear me say this, but if you look throughout the Bible, if you look throughout scripture, you're gonna find suicidal ideations and suicide attempts several places in scripture. Uh, for one of them uh, is King Saul and his armor bearer whenever he uh, loses his three sons in a battle and he's about to face a crushing defeat, he decides to take his own life. It says this in 1 Chronicles. Saul groaned to his armor bearer, take your sword and kill me before these pagan Philistines come to taunt and torture me. But his armor bearer was afraid and would not do it. And so Saul took his own sword and fell on it. When his armor bearer realized that Saul was dead, he fell on his own sword too. Or maybe you think of Elijah. Elijah is one of the most famous prophets in Jewish history that ever, after he has one of his most defining victories in his life, he defeats uh, over like hundreds of false prophets uh, when he's, you know, trying to um, represent God on his behalf. And after that happens, he runs to a cave and people are chasing him. And he has some suicidal thoughts. He says this in 1 Kings, then he went alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Maybe you can relate to that. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. Or maybe you think of the most famous suicide in Scripture, and that is of Judas, one of Jesus' best friends. That after Judas betrays Jesus, he's overwhelmed with grief, overwhelmed with depression. And he decides to take his own life. And whether you see it or not, whenever you look through Scripture, it is impossible to avoid the fact that suicide is found in many places in the Bible. And so if that's true, why don't we talk about it in the church more? And to answer that question, I would say two different things. And the first one is this. Very simply, this is just an uncomfortable topic. 
that everyone in this room and everybody watching online today comes to the table with different experiences, with different backgrounds when it comes to the topic of suicide. That we all have different opinions, we all have different presuppositions, we all have different questions surrounding this. And talking about this subject in a setting this large is somewhat akin to leading a large group of people across an emotional minefield. That one wrong step, one wrong phrase, one wrong, wrong word could trigger something catastrophic in the lives of somebody else. This is very simply just an uncomfortable topic. But the second thing I would say is that the reason that we don't talk about this in churches more is because many people and many pastors feel very under-resourced to tackle this kind of subject. That far too many people just feel out of their league when it comes to the subject of suicide. And I can't blame them, though, because their teachers probably never talked about it. Their professors probably never talked about it. Their pastors probably never talked about it. And I highly doubt that their parents did either. For most people, a sad truth is that this topic is generally researched or discussed out of needs of necessity rather than one we choose to be proactive about. And when that's true, that ultimately leads to a culture both inside and outside the church uh, where we would rather avoid this topic and where people feel ill-equipped and under-resourced. But just because those things are true, just because this topic is uncomfortable, just because people feel under-resourced, it doesn't negate the importance of talking about this in places like this, in settings like this, and with people like us. And so today, to kind of counteract those two things, I just want to have a very open and honest conversation with you guys about the topic and the subject of suicide and I want to tell you a couple different things that I've learned about suicide over the years, uh, specifically three different things that I've learned about what suicide is and what suicide is not. And the first thing I would say about suicide is this. Suicide is not so much about the desire to die as much as it is about the desire to stop living. And that may sound like a small semantic difference to many of you, but I can promise you that it is a huge difference in terms of understanding. And I think the writer of Ecclesiastes, he sums up pretty well what many of us have felt before, what many people who have had suicidal ideations have felt like before when he says this, their days of labor are filled with pain and grief. Even at night, their minds cannot rest. It's all meaningless. Now, for most people that find themselves in this place, their life holds so much despair and suffering that suicide sometimes feels like the only alternative. And it's not so much that life, or sorry, that death is uh, appealing, as much as it is that life feels agonizing. That after analyzing life and looking at the many obstacles placed in front of a person, sometimes the path of least resistance, the best way forward, sometimes to leave the path behind altogether. And for most people that have suicidal tendencies, for most of us that have been in situations like that, it's not the desire to die as much as it's the desire to stop living. That's the first thing. Second thing I would say about suicide is this. That suicide is not a pain medicator. That suicide is a pain multiplier. That many of the people I've talked to and many of the people that I've experienced these conversations with, they've talked to me about how big of a burden they feel that they are being uh, both to their family and their, their friends. That all of the doctor's visits, all of the counseling sessions, all of these false summits where they feel like they're finally getting over it, only to end up in a very similar place. All of these have led many people to believe that they are the only thing standing in between the people that they love, the people that we love, and the happiness that evades them. You see, over the last several weeks, one of the things that I did in terms of research was I took the time to read somewhere around 75 different notes uh, written by people who had died by suicide. And while these things were tragic, and by all means heartbreaking, one of the themes I began to pick up on was this right here that we're talking about. That for many of them in these notes, there was a section in there urging their families to just move on, to forget about them and live out the dreams that they were keeping them from. That somehow in this mixed state of despair and confusion in their minds, they were the root cause of both their own suffering, but all the suffering of their family and friends. And I don't know about you, but that breaks my heart. Because while that's their side of the story, I also took the time to read over 50 stories of people that had survived their attempt on suicide. And you know what those testimonies had in common? That the moment they pulled the trigger, 
the moment they stepped off the bridge, the moment they swallowed the last pill, that in that moment they knew their decision to end their own life would never really fix or solve or appropriately remedy the situation or the suffering that they found themselves in. That at the end of the day, they realized that their death by suicide would not end the pain and suffering of all the people around them, but instead it would invite more of it. Guys, you can never imagine how much the people around you would miss you if you were gone. You can never really know how much they truly love and care about you. I love how one of the survivors put it after her own attempt. She said this, that in that moment, I realized that my life was never mine to take in the first place, that it belonged first to the God that saved me, but second to all the people that loved me. I love that. Suicide is not a pain medicator. It's a pain multiplier. That would be the second thing I'd say. The third thing I'd say about suicide actually has to do with more of my position as a pastor. Uh, that uh, this is one of the ways I think the church has got it wrong in the past, and it has to do with one of the most frequently asked questions in church when it comes to suicide, and it's this question right here. If you die by suicide, are you going straight to hell? Uh, That is the question we get asked several times as pastors, and so to answer that, I would say this, uh, that suicide is not the unforgivable sin, but it is a sin. And that if you were to look through scripture, if you were to look through the entire Bible, nowhere in scripture are you going to find that if you die by suicide, you're going to hell. It's just not there. It's just simply not there. Not only that, but I think it's asking the wrong question. Because the question isn't, did somebody die by suicide? The question should be, did they die knowing uh, that the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ covered over all of their sins? And I do believe that suicide is a sin. I believe it goes against what God says and who God is, and I believe all sin grieves the heart of God deeply. But I think we begin to play a very dangerous game when we crawl up into God's throne and we play God and we start dictating who gets to go where. One of my favorite answers to the question of if I die by suicide, will I go to hell? One of my favorite answers to answer that question is this. That's not my job. And very simply, thank God it's not my job. Should I have to judge myself for my own sin as well? You see, put simply, suicide is not the unforgivable sin, but it is a sin. And so we've spent a little bit of time now growing in our awareness up here. We've talked about what suicide looks like cognitively, but really quick, I want to bring it down here. I want to personalize this. I want to localize this. Because the truth is suicide is not something that happens on some distant shore. Suicide is something that happens both outside and inside your front doors. So many people don't know this about me, uh, but growing up and in high school and in college, I had two nevers for God. And if you're wondering, you should never have any nevers for God, but I had two. And my two nevers for God were this. I never want to be a student pastor, and I never want to work in a church plant. And God kind of laughed, and obviously he sent us here. And so now I tell God, you know, I never want to do ministry in Hawaii, and I'm just waiting to see uh, what will happen with that. But I tell you that because I am here. And I am a student pastor, and I am working at a church plant, and I didn't just crumple under my convictions. That there is something very definitive that brought my wife, Jessica, and I here, that when we were interviewing for a couple different churches, while, yes, we loved the culture here, we loved the staff, we loved the fact that going to church uh, was fun again, while all that was true, there was one need that ultimately brought us here. And it's the topic we're talking about today. If you guys didn't know this, uh, Colorado ranks in the top 10 states uh, for highest suicide rates in the nation year after year after year. Not only that, uh, but El Paso County, where a majority of us call home, uh, we have the highest suicide rate in the state. And so what that means is that in this city, in the city that Trace Church is planted, in the city that a majority of us call home, in the city that Jessica and I felt burdened to be a part of, And in the city of Colorado Springs, we have one of the highest suicide rates in the nation. And if you didn't know this, suicide kills more teens than anything else in this city. More than automobile accidents, more than drug or alcohol abuse, more than homicide victims. Last year, 140 people died by suicide. And that number is not just a statistic because we know with those 140 numbers, there's 140 different names with 140 different families, with 140 different stories, all of which matter to God. And that number comes nowhere near close to the amount of people that were hospitalized or that attempted their own life and didn't complete their suicide. 
And I hope to some degree those numbers, they bother you. I hope to some degree those numbers, they burden you. Because we could sit here all day long and we could point fingers and we could talk about why that is and why that's the case here. We could talk about our heavy military population that exists here in the city of Colorado Springs. We could talk about the fact uh, that there's a lot of affluence here, that there's a lot of wealth and with a lot of money come a lot of expectations that are placed on kids. We could talk about the fact that even the weather here, that there's three months in the year where it rains every single day at three o'clock and we could talk about how that affects people's decision to take their own life. But at the end of the day, what I want you to be aware of, what I want you to come to realize is that we have a problem. That here in Colorado Springs, not them out there, not the people that struggle with this, but the people who live here in Colorado Springs, us, we have a problem. And it's one thing to be aware of that problem, but it's a whole nother thing to be moved towards action. And if there's anything that's gonna overcome our apathy, it is a call to action. But I think one of the reasons that so few of us actually move to action when it comes to a problem of this magnitude is because it's not personal to us. That many of us have never been in this situation for our own lives. Many of us have never been in a conversation where somebody is struggling with this. But even if we were, we wouldn't know where to start. Guys, I remember my first time having a conversation like this with someone. I felt like I was far too young to be having it. I was in college at the time, I was an RA, and there was one of the students, one of the boys on my floor, that I'd noticed he wasn't sleeping as much. I knew he wasn't eating like he should be. I knew all the things that were bringing him joy at one point in his life were no longer bringing him joy. And I used to go to bed at like 9.30 or 10 o'clock in college, and so I went to bed at that time and uh, I couldn't sleep at all. I felt burdened. And I remember laying in my bed for like three or four hours and getting up in the middle of the night to go check on him. And I walked into his room and he wasn't there and I got really worried. And so I went and I went to one of the spare bedrooms in our, our dorm and sure enough, there he was, head in hands, tears streaming down his face all alone. And I remember thinking in that moment, listening to him talk, talking to me about all the things he was struggling and I remember just feeling so terrified. I remember thinking, God, what if I say the wrong thing? God, what if I ask the wrong question? God, what if I just make this worse? What if I do everything right and he still decides to take his own life? I can't live with that guilt. If you've ever been in a situation like that, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But I want to be a church that is not just defined by awareness. I want to be a church that is defined by action. And so this morning, maybe you're a parent, and maybe your kid or your student, they come to you, and they're talking about the suicidal thoughts they've had. What do you do? Or maybe you're a friend, and in a moment of transparency, somebody opens up to you about what they've been struggling with. What do you do? Or maybe you're a boss or a coworker, and you notice something is off about somebody you work with or that works for you. What do you do? And so this morning, very simply, I just want to give you three very, very practical, clear steps that you can take, that you can put in your tool belt, and hopefully you never have to use them. But I want to give you these three action steps that hopefully uh, you could use if you ever find yourself in this situation so you can feel just a little bit more equipped. And these three steps are these right here. Be available. Ask good questions. Get them help. Be available. Ask good questions get them help. Be available, ask good questions, get them help. I want to go ahead and I want to work through these uh, one at a time. So the first one is be available. Throughout all my study, throughout all my research, uh, there was one study that really bothered me. One statistic, and it's this right here. The number one reason that teens and students don't tell their parents about their suicidal ideations is because they've tried and their parents don't take them seriously. That I'm not a parent. But if you want to know the one statistic that makes me the most angry, it's that one right there. And so with as much seriousness as I can muster this morning, like I am tired. I'm tired of talking to students. I'm tired of talking to kids who share with me what's going on in their life and their emotions and trying to process this well and telling their parents the very same thing only for their parents, specifically their dads, specifically their dads, telling them to suck it up to move on, 
to get over it, that everybody has hard days, that real men don't cry. And so with as much seriousness as I can muster this morning, can I get in your face a little bit? Dads, we have to stop that. That you have no idea, no idea how much damage you are doing to your children. We have to look out for phrases. We have to learn to be available when we hear phrases like, I just don't know if this is worth it anymore. When we hear phrases like, I'm just looking for a way out or I don't know how long I can keep doing this. Sometimes it's as blunt as maybe I should just kill myself. When we hear phrases like that, we should immediately stop what we're doing and learn to be available for some people that very clearly need us. And those are decisions you have to make long in advance, not when you get into those situations. Over the course of the last several weeks, I was talking to one of my buddies about this topic, and he was an officer in the military, and he told me that whenever somebody uh, that was under his command, one of his soldiers came to him, and he realized they were having suicidal ideations, the very first thing he did, I love this, the very first thing he did was he cleared his entire schedule. Because he wanted those people to know he, they had his priority. Guys, that's what it looks like to be available. So the first thing I would say is be available. The second thing I would say is ask good questions. One of the other studies I was reading uh, was talking about, you know, what made people go from wanting to attempt uh, to, to die by suicide uh, to turning around and going the complete opposite direction. And the number one thing that caused people to do that was that they had somebody who would listen to them. That was it. They had somebody that would listen to them. And it wasn't people preaching at them. It wasn't people saying the right thing. It was just somebody that would listen. And I think that's what asking good questions is all about. And there's a couple questions. I've done this enough times, uh, sadly, that this has become somewhat of a packaged conversation for me. That I have a few questions that I ask almost every single time I find myself in one of these moments. And so really quickly, I'd like to walk through what one of these conversations looks like for me and the attempts that it might help equip you if you ever find yourself in this situation or maybe, uh, you know, you find a loved one in this situation. And so usually these conversations, they go something like this. Hey, Josiah, can I tell you something I've never told anybody before? And me trying to be available is, is like, yes, of course, you know, let's go sit down for this conversation. Generally, the next thing they tell me is, hey, do you promise to keep this between you and I? Do you promise to keep this confidential? And over the years, I've just learned to use this phrase. I always say, hey, man, I care about you. I love you. And I promise I'll keep this private, but I'm not going to keep it confidential. Because if I need to help you, I don't want to feel like I'm breaking your trust. I don't want to feel like I'm breaking a promise. So I'll keep it private, but I won't keep it confidential. And 9.5 times out of 10, they tell me anyway. And they begin to share how hard life has been and the obstacles that are in front of them. And eventually, I hear one of those trigger phrases. That it's, you know, I don't know how long I can keep doing this. Or I've had a lot of really dark thoughts recently. Or I'm thinking uh, this isn't worth it anymore. I'm just looking for a way out. And immediately whenever I hear one of those uh, phrases, immediately triggers in my head uh, two different questions. And I'd write these questions down because I promise you they will save a life someday. But the first question I always ask is I say, you know, hey man, I love you and I care about you. And I know that was really hard for you to share with me. And so first, I just want to say thank you for sharing that with me. I really appreciate you trusting me with all of that. And I'm sure that's really hard, but I got to ask you this, and this is going to be an awkward question and maybe an awkward conversation, but I got to ask you, are you thinking about killing yourself? And you might be like, whoa, Josiah, like what if they're not? What if they're not thinking about suicide at all? Didn't you just put that in their brain? And to that, I would say, no, um, I don't actually have the power to do that with someone. And if they're thinking about suicide, they're thinking about suicide. And if they're not, it's a whole lot better to have that discussion up front than to just let it kind of meander on. So that's the first question I ask, are you thinking about killing yourself? And if they answer yes to that, my immediate follow-up question is this right here. Do you have a plan? Do you have a plan? And if they begin discussing with me their plan uh, to attempt their own life, I know they've thought through it enough. And so my next action is to call 911 and just wait until help arrives and keep them talking. But if they answer no to either of those questions, the best thing I can do for them, as I've told you earlier, is to listen. And so I want to keep them talking. I want to ask good questions. And one of the best ways I've learned to ask good questions is just by mirroring anything vague that they say and turning it back on them as a question. And so it sounds something like this. Uh, Josiah, I've just really been struggling lately. Oh, you've been struggling. Well, tell me about that. 
well, yeah, work has been really hard, and I feel like I'm still trying to get the hang of things. Well, work has been hard. What do you mean? Like, tell me, tell me what's going on at work. Well, my boss is a jerk, and I feel like he never gives me a break. And then it's like, oh, your boss is a jerk. What's he doing? And you guys get the picture. But it's providing them with just another opportunity to get the things that they've held inside on the outside. It's providing them with an opportunity to talk and an opportunity for us to listen. And so what do we do? First, we be available. And then second, we ask good questions. But then the final thing is this. We get them help. We get them help. And somebody in this room, somebody watching online today, you need to hear me say this very, very clearly. That the weight of their world does not fall on your shoulders that you are not responsible for the decisions that they make, that everything that happens in their life is outside of your circle of control. There are people that are far better trained than we are, far better equipped, who have a lot more time and experience dealing with situations like this. Because listen to me, if you are that person that believes you are the only one that can help your loved one, I promise you there will be a day that comes where you can't pick up the phone, where you're having a hard day yourself, where you can't provide that person with enough energy and the attention that they so desperately need. Listen, you should not and cannot carry that burden alone. You were not created to do so. You are not strong enough, and that's okay. And that's okay. And we have to get people help. I want to remind you as a church that we as a church, we've committed to this, and we want to get behind you on this, that today if you need help or somebody you love needs help, we want to get behind you on that, and so we want to pay for their very first counseling session with Dr. T. And if that's something that you are interested in, if that is something that you need, I would encourage you, just email this email uh, right here. That'll get you set up uh, for that counseling session. We'd love to help you in that way. But I also want to provide you with a couple other resources. This number right here, please save this in your phone. This is the National Suicide Hotline. I've used this on several occasions for some of the people that I've been working with. There's always someone there who will answer the phone. Please record that number. The last thing is this. If you need prayer, if there's something you need prayer about and you want to be a little bit more discreet about it, I would highly encourage you, email this email right here, cares at tracechurch.com. That's going to get you connected with our cares pastor, and we would love the opportunity to pray for and with you in a particularly hard season. And so as a church, as I've said, we don't just want to be aware of the problem. We want to be a church that moves towards action. And how do we do that? We be available. We ask good questions. And we get people help. So to close, I just want to say this. And I hope this clip of this sermon gets shared more than any others because I believe it is that important. And that is this right here. It's not lost on me that today some of the people in this room, some of the people that are watching online right now, are struggling with suicide as we speak that maybe you're thinking through your life and you're trying really hard to see if it's worth it anymore. You're trying really hard to overcome some of the barriers and obstacles that are present in your life. And you're wondering if you should just throw in the towel. You're thinking in your mind that maybe it would just be better for you and better for everyone else if you just weren't here anymore. And if that's you, can I just say, please just stop what you're doing and listen to what I have to say to you. Because just because you may have given up on your life, God has not given up on you yet. That you are not a mistake. You're not a burden. You're not an accident. That we would rather suffer beside you than suffer without you. That God has created you uniquely with a purpose. And for the moments that we forget that that is true, he sent his son to die for you. So that you would know that you are worth it. And listen, there is help and healing that is available to you. And it may not work the first time. And it may not work the second or the third time either. But we want you to know your life is still worth living, even if you cannot feel that right now. And so if you need help, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. Your life is worth the fight, and you've got a whole group of people here at Trace that are rooting for you, that are hoping that you succeed in this, and that want to get behind you. Whatever you need, please let us know. And maybe you can relate to Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 11 that says this right here. Are you tired? Are you worn out? Burnt out on religion? This is Jesus speaking. Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. 
I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Guys, I know today has been heavy. I know I've, it feels like I've thrown a fire hydrant of information and content at you today. And I think one of the things that is true of us in moments like this is we become aware of this problem and we get equipped to take action. And in these moments, we get like really pumped up and then it's like, well, what do we do now? And so this morning, I want to give you an opportunity to respond And one of the ways that we do this every single week is all around the rooms, there's going to be some juice and some crackers on some tables. And this is an opportunity for us to remember exactly what it is that God did did for us through his son, Jesus. That God created us, yes, for a purpose, but then he sent his son, Jesus, to die for us so that we would remember that we're worth it. And that Jesus went to a cross so that someday all the anxiety, all the depression, all the hopelessness, all the suicide, so that someday all of that would go away. And we want to take a moment every single week in the craziness that is life to remember exactly what it is he did for us. But one of the other ways I want us to respond this morning is a little bit different. And I want us to do this wherever we're at, whether we're in this room, whether we're watching online today. And whenever I was growing up, I learned uh, very quickly uh, in my life that to take one knee meant defeat, that you were given up, you were thrown in the towel, but to take two knees meant surrender. And this morning, I want to give us an opportunity to respond and surrender, to take a moment to take something that is very much so outside of our control, that is too big for us to handle and to put it into bigger hands to put it into the hands of the only one who can actually make a difference in this area. And what I love about this posture is that all emotions, all feelings, everything is welcome whenever you're on your knees praying to God. And maybe this morning, I just want us all to have just an honest conversation with God to take a moment and talk to God about where we're at. And so maybe for you this morning, it's simply taking some time to yell at God to scream at him and talk to him about how desperate you are for help, that you're discouraged, that you're anxious, that you're frustrated, that you're angry, that life seems unfair. I promise he can handle it. So maybe you take a moment this morning and you have an honest conversation with God about where you're really at. But then for the rest of us in the room, I would just ask that we take the time to pray, to pray to God, to take this away from our city, that this is a problem that the number one reason people die from suicide is because of social disconnection. And this has been one of the most socially disconnected seasons of many of our lives. And so I just wanna ask God to send people to the people that need the help the most. And so this morning, what I would ask of you is if you're able that you would join me on your knees, that you would take the time here in just a second to get down on your knees and join me as we pray for this city. And then whenever you feel ready, feel free to go take communion. And then uh, Tyler and Maria are going to come up and sing afterwards. So if you would join me, if you're able, please join me on your knees as we pray. God, we are grateful for this moment. And God, we are often frustrated when we face something in our lives that is beyond our control, that is beyond our reach to change. And so we want to take this and we want to put it in your hands. God, for the people that are in this room right now that are struggling, struggling to see the worth of their life, struggling to see the truth of your son, God, I I would pray that you just make it irresistible to them, that you would send your spirit into them, that they would be provided with peace that passes all understanding. God, for the people that are socially disconnected right now and are alone in the city, that you would just send your workers to go and comfort them. God, set up divine appointments where we can share the hope of your son Jesus with them. God, that you would act in mighty ways and you would do more than we could ever ask or imagine because of your Holy Spirit working in us and the people of Trace Church. God, help us not to just be people that are aware, but help us to be people of action that step into the messiness of life. 
and share the hope of Jesus Christ with the people that we know. God, we love you. And we're so grateful for Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
feel like this is a moment and so if you don't want to leave this moment we don't want to rush you out of here uh, feel free to stay and sit and pray and we've got tables in the back if you want to go down go and write a prayer request before you leave today our staff will be diligent this week in praying over that I want to say a couple of things really quick some people would look at my position as the lead pastor and they would say, man, you're going to hand over the subject of, stu- of suicide to your student pastor? <laughs> Never hesitated. And I think the best compliment that I could give Josiah is he, he preached that message better than I ever could have. And so I'm so thankful for the people that, have, that God has brought here. I'm so thankful for the voices that we have and how they're being used for the glory of Jesus. And I want to give you a moment. Whatever that moment needs to look like, um, we just want to extend that to you. I was going to say some stuff about COVID, and man, I'm not. I'm, I'm just sidelining that. But, so feel free to look for an email coming out this week. We want to communicate some things about COVID protocols, but I just don't even want to go there right now. So I'm going to pray to conclude our time together, and whatever you need, um, we are a church that's committed to extending hope when life hurts. So let us know how we can extend that hope for you. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to conclude. Father, we know that your Holy Spirit is with us always. But I do believe there are times when your Holy Spirit, the presence of your Holy Spirit, fills rooms and places and hearts and lives. I believe that moment is happening right now. So, Father, we don't want to extinguish that. We don't want to put a timeline or a time frame on that because we have services. So Father, this space is yours. These people are your children. I pray that you would just continue to move in, in every, every way that they need you to move in their lives right now. And so may your presence fall in this place. God, we love you. We thank you that there is always hope No matter how hopeless our lives feel and the circumstances that surround it, there is always hope. God, show us how we can be extensions of that hope. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You guys are dismissed.